Um, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Lim now as our next speaker. He's been moderating all of the session so far. Dr. Lim is an associate professor in our de Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Johns Hopkins. And he specializes in disorders of hearing, neurotology, and skull-based surgery. He is also a faculty member at the Peabody Conservatory of Music, which is associated with Johns Hopkins. That's our music school. And Dr. Lim has a, a, an extreme interest in music and music perception, especially by people with hearing impairment and cochlear implants. He received his undergraduate degree at Harvard and a medical degree from Yale, and then came to Johns Hopkins as a surgical resident um, and stayed on as a faculty member. He also did some postdoctoral research at the National Institutes of Health with Dr. Al Brown. I hope no one falls in the dark. Okay. Uh, his current areas of research focus on the study of the neural basis of mu musical improvisation and creativity, and the study of music perception in deaf individuals with implants. And Dr. Lim has uh, been a really great um, uh, force in, in public speaking and. Um, getting out there to the public, and uh, you can all go online and Google him. Uh, he's actually given a TED talk if you want to see him talk again and catch some of what he's talked about before. Um, so uh, without further ado, this is Dr. Lim. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. I, I was going to introduce myself, but it just seemed kind of goofy. Um, you know, so everybody has their own reasons for why they pick what they want to do in their life and think about what's important to, me, to them. And for me, it's always been sound. And I, I know Dr. May said that we don't care about sound, but I care about sound quite a bit. Um, I always have, and I'm not sure why. Ever since I was a child, I found myself obsessed with sound to a level that I just cannot explain. I can tell you that for me, it was all about music. I sense that my whole life in, in some way has been about music because it's one of the few things that I've just always had a deep, deep curiosity about. Now, I'll tell you that I think about music on an almost unhealthy level, okay? <laughs> I, I think about it all the time. I just cannot stop thinking about it. I don't know how else to describe it. I go to bed thinking about it, I dream about it, and I wake up thinking about it. I treat patients with hearing loss because I'm interested in whether they can hear music, and then I study music in the lab, and then I go home, I listen to music on the way home, and then I play instruments when I get home and sing to my kids. It just goes on all day long. And so, you know, for me, I've always wondered how I can take this deep obsession I have with sound and music and apply it to something useful. And so hopefully, and I don't know if I am, but hopefully I'll be able to share some of my work with you on music. And so I've talked about why I like music. Let's listen to a little music together, if we can. I can't either. <laughs> if we could uh, toggle over. That wasn't you, that's uh, literally the... Uh... This is the quiet part of the music. <laughs> could, can you switch my PowerPoint over, please? You're not getting a video? Okay, well then, okay. In, let me know when you get video and then we will proceed with that part. Um, let me see, okay, we're hearing this, but I still need video. Getting any images there? Did you try going to your? Uh, Do you want to retoggle? Sure, yeah. See if you're. Okay, we haven't changed anything. Excuse me. All right. Now uh, we got it to display. Oh, Sorry about this. Let's see if that works. No, we just lost it again. It's going off on presenter. There, no, there we go. Okay. All right. Now. There are a lot of things that that beautiful, profound moment of music maybe was a little disrupted there. However, <laughs> when you hear it, I'm sure you think of different things. Maybe Richard Einhorn in the audience thinks about how that piece was composed. Maybe, this is not working, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody might think about how it's performed. Some might, somebody might think about how it's perceived with emotion. 
and somebody might understand how it's recorded. There are a lot of things to think about when we think about music. Now, okay, I am going to try to have the whole slide appear on the page. Give me one second, I apologize again. I hope not. Okay. Moment of truth. All right, okay, so now, what I was saying was there are a lot of things that one can think about when we think about music. And what I think about is this, okay? I think about the inner ear, and I think of how ludicrous it is to try to understand music by staring at the ear. And the, the, the reasons why is that if we look at the eardrum and we look at the inner ear all day long, we will never really understand how it is that music can be meaningful to us. And I think it's really important to ask why music. I mean, music is bizarre. These are acoustic vibrations in the air. They're abstract, they're meaningless, yet somehow they enter our ear canals, they affect our eardrums, and they transfer in a way to our brain that we have a cognitive perception of something meaningful, emotional, significant that some of us would change our lives for. Okay? So this is sound taken to an extreme level in terms of its poignancy and in terms of its, its compelling nature. And, I, and obviously I'm not the first to think this. There are many, many people that have wondered why music, and I think always will. This is a bone flute thought to date about 50,000 years ago, carved from the femur bone of a bear, okay, that has holes in it that correspond to diatonic scale tones. What are we saying? We're saying that primitive human beings who are very busy decide to make musical instruments. And for what? To play what? There's no literature, okay? So there's no musical scores. There's no lessons. Human beings from the earliest recorded times have been driven to perceive and produce music. Which leads us to this next question, which I think many of you here have thought about, you know, maybe for your whole lives. What if we couldn't hear music? And I think that people take for granted that we can hear music, but I'll tell you that there is nothing more difficult to hear than music, okay? And there's a reason why that's the case. Music has a very different function than language. Dr. May talked about communication. He talked about precision of information. One thing he didn't mention is beauty, okay? Now, for music, the experience is supposed to be beautiful. Okay? It does, it's not enough that you understand the lyrics being spoken and can write them down on a sentence. With music, if it doesn't sound good, what's the point? And so we have to start thinking about whether, whether or not one can understand music. It's not really a question of correctness. Okay? It's not a right or wrong question. And to a certain extent, the idea that if you can hear music, you can hear anything, I think, applies. Whereas if you can hear language well, that does not in any way lead to the extension that you could hear music well. Okay. Now, what I'm showing you is four kind of gross pictures here. And on the upper left is a normal eardrum, okay, what we hope to see when we look in someone's ear. Oftentimes we see the bottom left, which is a perforation of the eardrum or big hole. Now that's one reason why you won't be able to hear well. Or somebody might have a clustiotoma, which is a skin cyst. In fact, some of you here probably had clustiotoma surgery that led to destruction of your ossicles. Or you can even get something like a cancer of the temporal bone, which requires your entire auditory apparatus to be removed. It's remarkable how small and insignificant in appearance the hearing nerves are. What I mean by that is when I'm doing surgery of the, of the hearing nerves at the skull base, these nerves are tiny little strings. I mean, you could just twang them and, and cut them like, like that, and you could render somebody with normal hearing completely deaf in, in half second uh, you know, on one side and then a half second on the other side. And it's a pretty dramatic thing to realize that our entire auditory world is communicated through these little cables, little wires that, that walk in. Now, that's not gonna work so well if you have something like this, which is an acoustic neuroma sitting on your hearing nerve. And I, I'm sure that some of you here are here because you've had acoustic neuromas that have deteriorated your hearing or had surgery that required treatment, uh, sorry, that required sacrifice of your hearing nerves. Now, what this gets down to is that if we really wanna understand something like music, we need to think about the brain and not just the ear. And so I um, was very frustrated when I first started my studies in otology that we were listening to blips and bleeps. I mean, you come in for a hearing test, you get doot, 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 
doot. And I, I thought to myself, how are we ever going to understand something like Beethoven if all we're doing is listening to blips and bleeps? And so, you know, most of you know that when you have an audiogram, it affects how, you, how loud things sound. It also affects how clear things sound. But if you take that to a musical level, I think the question becomes much more concrete, meaning that this is how a simulated Beethoven Sixth Symphony would sound if you had moderate to severe hearing loss with tinnitus. Now, this is probably the wrong audience to play a simulation to. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> I appreciate your patience. <laughs> and I guess what I'm trying to say is that for those of you that could hear that well, it doesn't sound anything like what we want it to sound like. I mean, it's just not even close. I mean, how, the, the talking about information that's perceived, it, it sort of goes out the window. Now, uh, it's been mentioned that technology has evolved, and it really has in dramatic fashion. I mean, literally in the 1800s, they used to take ear-shaped things and put them in your ears. Okay, that didn't work so well. And so now we've got the modern multi-channel cochlear implant. I'm going to show you a very quick surgical video of how this is done, because I think a lot of you have a, maybe a misconception of what's involved with cochlear implant surgery. This is a, now about a 90-minute operation, usually done as an outpatient. This is a video from Cochlear Corporation showing an incision behind the ear. And, this, and then the mastoid bone will be open. This is actually the bed for the device being a little seat for the implant to sit being drilled in so that the implant can rest. That's a template to mark where the device will sit. Then the mastoid bone will be open behind the ear canal right here. And then something called the facial recess or the posterior tympanotomy will be created in front of the facial nerve so that you are then looking at the middle ear space and actually looking at the cochlea. Now this is the actual movement into the middle ear right there. And you can start to see middle ear structures. And then you'll zoom up and you'll actually see the cochlea itself being open right here. And so that is a little dark tunnel that's going to be created into the cochlea. And so that is, in fact, you're staring inside a cochlea. Okay. There it's that hole. And then on an electrode, that's about a one millimeter opening. This is all done under a microscope. And then the electrode will be inserted into that one millimeter hole. And so you know, I, I realize that this has been, for some people in this audience, a very controversial topic and very emotional one. Let's at least uh, agree that this is just another example of evolving auditory technology, okay? meaning that this is far from perfect, and hopefully this is not where we will stop. But along the way, this has been maybe one of the most important advances in how doctors try to treat sensory neural hearing loss. And you wind up with something like this. Now, the results of this have been dramatic. I'm going to show you a video. This is a girl uh, born congenitally deaf with her mother. This is a patient of my mentor, Dr. John Naparco. That's an owl. Owl. Yeah. Owl. Owl. Yeah. Owl. Baby. And so this mother is doing everything she can to enrich the world for this child of hers with symbols and you know, affection and attention. But there's a limit. And again, I'm not saying that this child who lives without any hearing can't live a beautiful life like that. I'm saying that there are certain obstacles that she will face that people that have normal hearing will not face. And so this patient's family elected to pursue cochlear implantation. This is a video of her 10 years later. Mm -hmm. so, so you've written two books. I've written two books. Was the uh, other one a book or like a journal entry? No, the other one was a book. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Well, this, this book has seven chapters. And uh, the, last, the last chapter is entitled The Good Things About Being Deaf. Do you remember writing that chapter? Yes, I do. I remember writing every chapter. Yeah. 
Well, sometimes my sister can be kind of annoying, and so it comes in handy to not be annoyed by her. I see. And, and who is that? Kali. Oh, okay. Her sister. Her sister. My sister. And, and how can you avoid being annoyed by her? I just take off my CI and I don't hear anything. So <laughs> it's pretty, it comes in handy. So you don't want to hear everything that's out there? No. And, and so again, that's undoubtedly a modern medical miracle. I mean, this is a deaf child who's talking very normally with excellent speech, and really there's no delay or pause in her ability to, to converse at all. She's doing great in school. She's, it just has, she's doing fantastically. But there's an issue. When she turns on the radio, okay, the radio doesn't sound like it does to somebody with normal hearing. And that's because the acoustic requirements of music processing really are very different than those of language. By its very nature, music is heterogeneous, okay? From, an, uh, from a frequency perspective, from a dynamic range perspective, the acoustic information required to perceive music far exceeds that required to perceive speech. We all know that the main criteria people use to evaluate cochlear implant success is speech. Okay? These devices are optimized for speech. They were designed for speech, and they're measured by speech. It's very different than thinking that you could just use a speech-optimized device and all of a sudden understand music, which has such different acoustic properties. And so the truth of the matter is that cochlear implant users struggle to hear music. Okay? There are some that can perform surprisingly well, but even those performers would tell you that they are struggling with music. Musicians that have lost their hearing and get a cochlear implant are the best performers typically with music because of their brain but even they will tell you that the sound is not anywhere near what it used to be. And so let's try to look at why that might be. So music is complicated to define, and I don't want to get into too many philosophical definitions, but most of us would agree that pitches are a basic building block of music. And pitch is a sort of uh, subjective perception of a sound's fundamental frequency. Pitch perception, if you had to name one thing, Pitch perception would be the single obstacle that's most difficult for people that have a cochlear implant because pitch perception can be distorted by as much as two octaves in a cochlear implant user. Okay? So now let's just do a little experiment on this. This is a MIDI score for Rachmaninoff. So now I'm going to take that same piece and I'm going to inject plus or minus one semitone, so a ha half step on a piano, one note away, randomness into it. Okay, let's hear how this sounds. Now again, I'm not saying that that necessarily sounds horrible. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of hypnotic, but it's certainly different than I think what the composer intended and certainly different than what most of us expect to hear when we hear Rachmaninoff. Now, I think it's also worth noting that we are very far away from semitone resolution with cochlear implants. Okay? If we were able to achieve one semitone resolution, we would be thrilled. But an error of one semitone in pitch perception leads to that. And so we're very far away if we're talking about one or two octaves of pitch deviation. Okay, so realize that with pitch, we have a long way to go. Something else happens, which is called perceptual fusion of multiple pitches, meaning that most music, when you hear it, isn't just one person playing one note at a time. It's not like this situation where there's an isolated sound source. You turn on the, turn on the radio and you're hearing guitars, voices, bass, drums, keyboards, it's all mixed together all at once. And you've got multiple streams of information superimposed on top of one another. Well, if you actually ask a cochlear implant user to try to tell you the difference between one, two, and three notes, so one, two, and three, 
we found that many cochlear implant users cannot tell us the difference between three, two, and one. It all sounds like one to them, okay? So when they hear three notes, they're more likely to say that that's one. In fact, much more likely to say that's one than a person that has normal hearing. So they're fusing these notes together, which sort of implies multiple things in terms of streaming, but also for the ability to use timbre, which is information of how a sound sounds, to actually just to discriminate between multiple moving sources. I mentioned earlier that sound quality may be the most important thing in the end with music, and I kind of liken it to this. So many of us that like music could hear it through a telephone. We could probably identify the sound, we could do a name that tune task, get it right, we could get the rhythm right, but we would never want to listen to it like that. Right? You don't want to hear music through a telephone. And so, again, the sound quality question, meaning how do you make a cochlear implant sound better than it does, is something that is really just now beginning to receive attention. It's been remarkably ignored, I think, because of the emphasis on speech and the testing measures of speech, which are being based on correct or incorrect. Well, with music, it's not so much, as I said, incorrect or, or, or not, it's how does it sound? And so we did some experiments where we took pieces of music and we degraded them in systematic fashion. We filtered out frequencies to see if these things mattered. And now, for the hip hop lovers in the audience, I'm gonna play an example of, of Usher, okay? And Usher, um, I'm gonna lower the volume because it's a little loud. You'll have two versions of this. So maybe to most of you that difference is dramatic. In our experiments, we had several cochlear implant subjects give those two the same exact quality ratings. Okay? They could not tell the difference between the worst version and the best version. Okay? Now again, what does that mean? It just means that we have a long way to go. Okay? Timbre, which is, I like to describe it as a sound of the sound, but basically it's tone color. It's the quality of a sound that has nothing, to, of a quality of a sound that has nothing to do with its, with its pitch or its loudness. It's everything else but pitch and loudness. It's what allows you to tell a clarinet from a trumpet, or hopefully tell them apart. And I'll tell you that this is a clarinet. This is a trumpet. This is a violin. This is a piano. It's probably not hard for you to see immediately that somebody with hearing loss might struggle with the first three because they actually have the same shape, the same envelope, okay? They have the same temporal characteristics on a broad scale. The piano is a little easier to, to differentiate because it has what's called a, a percussive envelope. It's a pitched percussive instrument. And so you can use the shape of the sound as a way to signify that it's a different instrument than a violin because you can't, you can't sustain a piano like you can sustain a violin. And so cochlear implant users, and, and actually we think a lot of hearing aid users are using envelope information predominantly and almost discarding what's called fine structure information when they look at things like timbre. So we made these sort of fake instruments, these mutant hybrid instruments that combined elements, you know, a guitar muted, made, it, made it together with a piano or a trumpet or whatever it was, and we asked cochlear implant users to tell us, what does this mutant instrument sound like? Invariably, they went with the shape of the sound. They took the envelope of the sound, and that is what they used to tell us what the instrument was. Even if it had 100% of the characteristics of a piano, if it sustained like a violin, they were gonna call it a violin, okay? So, is there any hope? <laughs> now, I, I don't know, does, is there anyone who knows who this is? This is Beethoven. Yeah. And so Beethoven um, actually had his, the reason why Beethoven's skull has been photographed is because his grave was exhumed after he died. Actually, it was exhumed twice. Now, you'll notice that there's a bulge on the right side of his, of his uh, skull there, and that bulge actually was thought originally to represent disease, but we now know that that bulge represents molding clay that was used to, to fill in the gap from his temporal bones where they were harvested after autopsy. The reason why I bring this up is that Beethoven had profound sensory neural hearing loss by actually relatively early on in his career that really progressed to the point that during the Ninth Symphony, he could hear nothing. He composed the Ninth Symphony absolutely in deafness and pre premiered it in deafness. 
That suggests something. Yes, it's a heartwarming story, but it means something. Okay? It means that the musical brain, once formed, doesn't necessarily deteriorate because of hearing loss. And we can take advantage of that. Okay? We can take advantage of the fact that the, once the musical brain has developed, we can harness that power that's there and maybe through some of our new technologies and our new methods, take advantage of all the work that's been done in your life to learn to hear so that you can hear again, make new sense of the sounds that you're getting. I'll tell you, if Beethoven walked into our clinic today, he'd get a cochlear implant. And he would have hated it. <laughs> now, there's another bit of hope here, which is that although pitch might be bad and although timbre might be, timbre might be bad, rhythm perception is actually relatively good in cochlear implant users. Now, that's not too surprising if you think about it, but it's kind of good to know in that cochlear implants are very good at transmitting time, okay? And so what I, we did an experiment here where you played a beat. Sorry, that's just four beats in a row. Now, there's gonna be a four beat pattern, same pattern, but the last beat will be either a little early or a little late. It's very subtle. It's a task of temporal clocking, okay? You need to hear the clock implied by the first three beats in order to do the task. Turns out that cochlear implant users performed as well, actually slightly better than our normal hearing subjects in this rhythmic cl clocking task. So timing information, at least on a crude level, is preserved in cochlear implant listening. There's also some interesting animal studies um, both, uh, both Amanda and Brad talked a little bit about some of the animal work they do. I was for very fortunate to work as a postdoc in David Rigo's lab and then to continue my work with him after, where we studied deaf white cats. And um, I don't know if, how many of you have white, a white cat, but um, if you've ever wondered why that cat's not listening to you and didn't know, most white cats have hearing loss. And so rather than just being a kind of you know, objectionable animal, that cat probably didn't hear what you were saying. And so, we actually have the ability to put a cochlear implant into a cat. And so this is a, a, an x-ray showing the implant going into the cochlea after surgery is done. And here's a video showing this cat that was trained to respond to a very specific trumpet sound to, to get some food. And you'll take a listen here. 